Um, my name is Martin Hedvang. I am the president or chairman of the Danish Association of Landscape Architects. Um, and I have the honor to present today's um, lecture <laughs> for, for this traditionally rich or normally very uh, yeah, uh, traditional um, lecture that we have. The, the lecture of today um, is a landscape designer who might not need too much of an introduction. It's Pete Udall. We're very pleased to, uh, to have him here. And I won't talk too much about his projects, um, the fact that he's been all the way around the world almost, and also done a very nice project in, in Copenhagen. But I will ask you, uh, maybe not a favor, but something to think about, because Pete has, uh, has accepted uh, that in the end we will have some, uh, some questions. And we, uh, we had a, a nice dinner uh, uh, yesterday, and then we had this, this discussion, uh, not discussion, but a little talk about which kind of questions are interesting to have. And you told me that you like the more silly questions. <laughs> so maybe you can think about that while you are <laughs> enjoying the lecture, and then not, say, not, not just asking the standard questions, but maybe ask a little bit more silly questions for, uh, for Pete after Surely his... in a good uh, way, yeah? yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but with no further ado, thank you so much for joining us, and thank you so much yeah. for taking your time. Thank and, you for having um, me, and uh, I'm glad to be here, see so many young people, students and uh, architects that have finished their... Uh, other further studies, and uh, yeah, I'm a landscape designer, just became a landscape designer out of love for plants, so plants were the passion, that's where I started it all with, and then was in a sort of, I wanted to design gardens, making gardens, it developed into, from small gardens into bigger landscapes, not, you know, till a certain amount, and then it becomes more, uh, yeah, what I say, a landscape out of reach, you know, something you can't control anymore. So all my landscapes and gardens are uh, have a certain size that they can be controlled by gardeners or, or uh, ecologists in the sense of at least they have to be maintained. So gardens have to be maintained. That is uh, landscape, not always. Yeah? Smaller landscape, the ones I do, they probably uh, need a good gardener on anything. But I will start what... what uh, yeah, so making a garden, you all know making a garden is not of, about what you want to make, it's what you are able to make and the restrictions you have have to do with, you know, the, the of course the limitations and, and of course the budget and the location and of course the client wishes. So if you work for a private client, it is often about the children and what they want and, you know, they, they need a trampoline or... Uh, we need the swimming pool. Well, uh, I love gardens in public, which need other, uh, uh, fill other uh, needs. And that's not about swimming pools and not about swings, uh, but it is about uh, experience and also, yeah, teaching and getting people involved in our profession. So location is, is one thing that wherever you work, you can see it's a city has other wishes, has another size, is public, is different than, for instance, a high line, which is a long and narrow line over two kilometers, where you can do, cannot do what you do here. You know, here you have a big plot, where you can make a garden, you can think about several ideas in that area, but here, in an area like this, it's more about a, a storytelling over the whole length, so different kinds of gardens that follow each other up. This is Noma. I worked there uh, uh, with Thing Brandt. They invited me to. Uh, here you are. Yeah, you see. <laughs> never met you again afterwards, but uh, nevertheless, you did a beautiful job on the garden, and I think the the infrastructure and everything looks very, very highly. But you know, we had to make a garden as well, and I think uh, that's for later. I will show it. And this is a city garden on the Hudson, the Battery in New York, which you can see is not. There's no person there. And you can see when you make a garden that it's really full of people. So you can see what a garden can do for, for people, uh, what the necessity is for green in the city and anywhere you work. 
So and then we have local context. So it's not easy, you know, you can work on an estate and see that the gardener is still into very classical uh, uh, ideas which look beautiful, you know, but very temporarily and very sort of short lived. Or you can work in the, in, in, on, on the shore uh, where there's a lot of uh, restrictions concerning the soil and, 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 the, and the wind and the sea and, and, and so it's not, or you can see this hard to do a garden there, but we did one. You see, this is the soil. You see, they scraped off the, the top soil, which is an acid soil of, of a, just a little bit darker than this. But, uh, or you have a wood, woodland garden, which limits you on, on the more di the dynamics of gardening. Huh? Flowers and everything in the summer is hardly possible. So you have to, gardens are, are, are uh, have a multi-purpose, but also they have their own sort of direction if what is possible. Now, like this uh, garden making, or uh, we work sometimes in, in the more southern countries like Spain, you have another flora, you have to go back and learn the flora, you uh, don't know anything. Hey, you know some plants by pictures, but you have to study again what will work. You have to talk with people what will do well. And, and, and also, so this is my latest one in Menorca. So you learn a lot by doing things you never have done before. I think that is what, uh, what happened in my life. And I think the scale important. I don't work on a scale like this, too big. I take a little part of gardens and say, this can be a garden that can be maintained. The other parts should be uh, yeah, done very much sort of with less and less uh, labor. You can see this is a garden we did in, uh, so this scale, and this is a smaller scale. And so you work from big to small. And I think for garden, I make them if you talk about plantings and dynamic plantings, I think six, seven, eight thousand square meters of granules. I think it's enough for how, how big the, the place is. Yeah? Then you have to work very extensive. You can make an orchard, you can make a meadow, you can make a sort of a, a re, reintroduce a flora that was there in the past, but that's my work. So, and what do you have to understand to create a garden? So a good garden uh, must be readable. Uh, you can see there must be a sort of rhythm, a repetition, and it uh, shouldn't be sort of disturbed. The eye shouldn't be disturbed by things that are showing up from one corner. So that is one of, uh, I think, one of the rules that I've learned. Uh, this unity, unity, readability, repetition uh, doesn't need that you have to use 100 species in every uh, varieties in every garden, but you can do it less. But the key words are always repetition, scale, balance. And uh, here you can really see what, what, what I mean. Um, and then seasonality, you have to understand what plants do, uh, whether they are short-lived, <laughs> biannual, or aggressive, or important for their flowers, important for their seasonality, have for, you know, uh, this, this is, I think in May, I can see it, yeah. So most of the plants are, there are plants in flower, but they're normally not plants that you use in summer gardens, in summer perennial gardens, because they are more sort of on the edge of shade uh, or, or, or wetlands and so on. So, but still uh, structure is very important in, in that time. Of course, the first flower you should see in February or, or, or January already with the hellebores, I think it's good. You don't need much because every flower is one and every flower is nice yeah? if you're at home in the winter. So this is, uh, but a garden, should, the same garden should look good in July as well. Uh, so there are many plants not in flower. We use many grasses because they give some structure. They don't need the flower to be good or to look good. Uh, and then Late summer, August, September, we have flowers, plants that normally come from other, many of them come from North Korea, no, not, no, I mean, North America, <laughs> also North Korea, but <laughs> North America. Now, you can see, so they come from Europe as well, or, or, or China, but uh, 
So that's for late flower. But most important after flowering is, of course, what plants do concerning their uh, yeah, character seed heads uh, uh, structure. You can see skeletons. You can see they, uh, it is important, of course, that every garden should also benefit wildlife uh, or insects or birds, everything that lives in your garden you want to see. So from bees to butterflies to uh, even a spider in its fall, uh, but it all belongs to your garden. And we have, we have a problem too, mice come also, and they can eat some of your plants. And you can, uh, normally we leave this till, uh, I think the end of January, February, where we then, uh, where we then just uh, cut it back so that the garden can have a new start. We plant bulbs in most gardens so that even already in January, got to start to get uh, some interest uh, by very early uh, late January with the snowdrops and then the crocus and, and so on and so on. So I think you are in, uh, yeah, in this time of the year, if you look at gardens, it's still not much. Huh? If you talk about perennial flowers, so woodland uh, flowers start to flower like pulmonaria and, and, uh, and I think uh, many bulbs, Anemona nemorosa, woodland uh, femorals start to flower. But that is also, and of course the hellebores, but I think it's important. Uh, important that the use of not only flowers, but grasses give this sort of uh, structure in the garden that uh, creates a uh, color, uh, which I have to call color, uh, although color is understood as something in flower, but not really. Uh, but this gives this sort of aspects in the garden that it gives uh, again that rhythm that gives the, the sort of the architecture of, of plants and, um, yeah, in a very nice way. And, uh, and I think if this is November, if I'm right, yeah, November, you don't expect flowers so much anymore. So it's about a few asters and it's about everything that is sort of uh, dying back to, uh, uh, to go dormant. This is. January, December, January. And then after this, sometimes it's a pity that you have to cut it back, but you have to be aware that there's bulbs coming up. You don't want to, stir, to have to stop, uh, to step on, on noses of plants that come up. So that's the time we cut it all back. And that uh, you can see how, how important the seed heads, skeletons can be for uh, the experience of uh, planting. See, and uh, doing this for so many years, you also know what plants do in this time of the year. So you know that if I take a monarda, uh, like here, or you take a, a, a gilia, that you have this beautiful sort of uh, uh, seed, seed heads or, or skeletons that work also like a composition. That is uh, about how we start. It's not about design, but it's about what we, how you have to understand the garden before you make it, and also how you, uh, how you have to start from budget client into what you want to do. And I'm talking only about my most, the most dynamic part of gardens because we, of course, we plant trees, we plant shrubs, and then uh, I see shrubs and trees as the structure, the house of any garden or landscape. But because this uh, working with perennials is so complex. So it has so much to do with uh, layering and with uh, seasonality, with, uh, with longevity, with, with uh, uh, yeah, being aggressive, non-aggressive, overruled by other plants and growth and, uh, and uh, uh, how, to, how it works over time. That, that is good to show what you can do. Uh, this is a private garden, private, uh, no, public uh, garden in Rotterdam. We did three gardens, so I saw just a few oversights. This is one of my first public uh, gardens in England, made in 2000, 20 years ago. Uh, Schwer Holman, that is in a, a housing company that uh, gave me a commission to do a garden, uh, you know, in this, uh, in this area where they renovated the houses, social area, social housing area. And they paid for the maintenance and they paid for a uh, for gardener, for the plants, for the whole garden. This is uh, 6,000 square 
meters or perennials. And I think uh, this is how it looked like, so you see a difference. <laughs> but we kept the path as people walked uh, the garden. We kept the path as, as the people walked through it from one uh, area to another area. And that was the basis of our uh, of the design. And I think that you see this circle around it. The, every circle has three or four different uh, varieties or even more. It's a combination that works from inside outside as a sort of perennial landscape. It's, uh, I think, already 10 years old, maybe older. Sometimes times go so quick. This is a park we did 10 years, 12 years ago in uh, Germany, Maximilian Park. You see a planting here, which is based on block planting, so groups combined with each other for their looks, uh, so that every combination is, is working well together. And again, that rhythm. That's a, a, a more traditional way of garden of planting design, which have changed over the years. We are now more in uh, ecological approaches, uh, uh, matrixes where a few plants are dominant and other plants come out. So, but that is how we start the design. So we have the, the layout of the groups and then all these little dots are uh, plants that emerge from, uh, from that planting. You see, so this is how I start with you know, putting everything on paper. And, uh, how we set them out so we make a grid on the drawing. We transfer the drawing on the on, on, on the lawn, on, on the ground, and then we just put the uh, plants out as uh, for the calculation of the number of plants. Every plant has a certain number per square meter, and we do the uh, sort of uh, an average of seven between seven and nine for the average plant. Every plant group. Of course, you need also good people that, you know, if you see the plants, that some are in flower here, but most plants are not in flower. So you need people that really know what they take out of the grapes. You know, that's uh, if we have three varieties of geranium and you say, and, and they, it often happens that they take the wrong one. Or, so you have to be <coughs> very careful with who helps setting out the planting. Now, this is an image of years ago, and you see what grasses do. Uh, they, they move around, and I think they, you don't feel that you miss something in general. And I think grasses are, are of course, always. This is one uh, Miss Molinia that emerges from this lower planting. Just give you an idea, I think, of uh, gardens. This garden is already, as I said, 12 years old. So. With good management, you can keep it going. Of course, the many things that are changing. As long as they keep you informed, you, this is done three years ago. It's more, we call that a robust planting perennials that are taller than what, let's say, in between, that can ha reach a size of two meters and more. But that gives you a sort of intimate uh, ID when you walk through it. <coughs> Uh, a little bit of drama, huh? <laughs> depends on the rain, and I think that uh, also we had some art projects that were only meant for one year or for a few years, uh, and in, this was in the park in uh, Germany also, not too big, but in a very classical park, and uh, but still, you see, you wouldn't expect it, but it was paid for by the government. They could do uh, and make a garden for the public that was a sort of as an uh, artistic expression, but it's still there. So, you see, and this is how we, how we mark the planting out. And this is uh, how it looks from above. Or a museum that we did in the Netherlands, and uh, we used a lot of annuals because uh, I think that. The garden commission was done in spring and the garden had to be open or wasn't done in the winter. I think uh, there were, and it had to open in September, so, or August. So many plants were sold out. I think sold out means that, you know, you can say, okay, we leave it open, but there was a opening by the king. And so, <coughs> we, had, so we made a mix of annuals and perennials. The year after, we had to take out the annuals and just rearrange the perennials again. So it was double work, but it had to be done. 
this is a museum of, but you can see a garden with annuals and perennials can also be very nice and uh, it's very short, of course, because they uh, also at Noma, they have a piece of the garden that is an experimental garden, which uh, where they use dahlias and annuals and, and, and some things that they want, uh, artichokes, sunflowers. But I think it's, uh, this will always look, you know, if, even if you mix it up, because there's so much happening and if you have the right plants, it looks good. Uh, but it is only for one year and maybe if you uh, are lucky, then the, the, some of the perennials will stay or they see them out. But then it's, uh, and that's what we did in this garden. Uh, also an art, art project was with Peter Sumtor, was in London for, uh, for one year. So we call that not a garden, we call that an installation. Uh, but the garden that uh, had to work from June till uh, November and it had to work right away. And it, I think that is also a big challenge because my profession is not about, uh, you know, the actual thing and uh, it's not about decoration. It's about making something for a future. That is, but there's always a challenge to get things on your way that you think, okay, I have time for it. And then when you start, suddenly you have to get uh, how am I going to do it? You know, how is it going to work? But you have to believe a little bit in yourself at the moment you say yes. Afterwards, you get the worries. Uh, <laughs> Lourdes Garden, that was a, uh, that was a uh, one of the few uh, competitions I, I joined. It was in 2000 for a garden in, uh, in uh, Chicago, and uh, Millennium Park, they call it. And it was named after one of the donors, uh, Miss Lourdes. She paid for the garden and for uh, she donated for the maintenance uh, a big sum of money. Here we are with the garden with Roy Dibblick who grew the plants. My wife is there. And this was the concept from the landscape architect. So make a garden uh, again with different, uh, 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 you could say garden types, concepts, a woodland garden. Uh, You see on the right hand side is a woodland garden and we have a sort of, uh, there is a, uh, a wall and then in the middle there, here I can just, yeah, this, this is the wall. So this is lifted up from this area. So we have three, four different types of, of, of gardens, plant garden concepts, I would say. A planting plan, you see that's the first attempt on the bottom to do something more with a uh, we call it more and more wilder planting, uh, we call it matrix planting where a few plants dominate and then other plants emerge from that. It was my first, uh, yeah, the first garden I did uh, outside the more traditional group plants. This was the garden where it was made. You see that is 2001. And I also had this uh, a sort of middle piece, which was sort of stood out. Uh, we call that a seasonal aspect. Yeah? So it flowered in June when most of the plants were not in flower yet. So with three kinds of sages, three kinds of salvias. And uh, quite long and impressive because you could see it from the buildings around it. And, uh, and this is the walkway above, so on the other level. And this is this big perennial meadow in the summer. And that garden has changed over years quite a lot. If you compare it with the original drawings, you will see there is almost nothing left, only the garden that still looks good. And I think that has to do with management uh, going over every two years to assess the garden, to talk with the gardeners, what shall we leave, what shall we let go, what shall we change? So that is, I think, the communication afterwards. And also uh, at the end, it's about the aesthetics. Uh, it's not about the number of species, it's about how it, how it looks, and you have to allow the garden to change. And there's one good thing, if you want to bring it back to normal, is always the original drawing. So you can start over again, but in the meantime, you let it go. A lot of North American species we use in our own gardens here in Europe in, uh, in, in planting design. And I think they come originally from North America, even uh, they're wild or, or 
and I learned a lot by by going in, uh, yeah, going and see prairie restorations. So where people were just restoring prairies to the original state, and that sometimes took them 15 years or longer. And uh, by seeding and reseeding, by mowing uh, sort of uh, by mowing areas that they don't uh, that just, let's say the, the the seed could germinate, right? And so. So I learned a lot, and that's why I use uh, uh, in the 90s, there were a lot of North American grasses introduced into Europe by a German uh, botanist. And we were very close to many growers at that time. So we had uh, access to many of the new species from North America and many uh, grasses that you probably will see more in gardens than, uh, than in the past. And, um, very useful. So not a traditional panicum, not a traditional miscanthus, but a sporobolus, this sort of schizagerium. There are many, many plants that are very garden worthy. And uh, also, so that we, that it's on the wrong place. That, uh, <laughs> uh, but the Highline New York, that is, uh, I think that was a competition in 2004 where people, uh, where the architect field operations asked me to uh, be part of well, if I could do the planting because they were landscape architects, but they're mainly uh, sort of built uh, built to build landscapes and planting was not uh, and they were in the final list of in the competition and they asked me to come with them because there was the question was that uh, the people of the neighborhood were more into plants than into design. So landscape was, you know, if you ask the neighbor, neighborhood people that live there, what do we want? They say plants. They don't say, they don't say we want a building or we want something else. So that, that's why I came in. And we, that was, uh, made a book, book about it, you know, this, uh, the Gardens of the Highland with Rick Dark, who lives in, uh, in, in, not in New York, but close by, and we became friends. And he pictured most of the Highland over the years. And I think you see, it's even, you can see that's two and a half kilometer. And you can see there are different areas. If you look at, uh, at, the, at the line over there, that's how it uh, goes from a woodland to a, a grasslands to, a, if you can read it here. Yeah, so it's a, an overlook. There's a, a, a more a, a preserved garden with only natives. So we, we try to bring as much in as possible, woodland, open woodland, half open woodland, uh, wildflower field, uh, and then the Hudson Yards, and I think a flyover. So it is really something that, uh, yeah, you can see as a story told over, yeah. over a line of two and a half kilometers. So it's different stories over one length. And I think that has uh, worked out quite well. We started in 2009, the first part was opened. And uh, this is how it looked <laughs> in the beginning. And this is the same place <coughs> where we used planters for trees that needed more soil. Then the effort soil depth is about 30, 40 centimeters, not on the edges, but they worked it up in the middle so that we have enough Never enough, of course, but we have enough for um, for most plants that will grow there. Uh, we put uh, ramblers over the edge, so Pisandra and some wisteria and you know clematis, and so that that also from the street you could see something uh, that that brought your eyes to the uh, to, to to the project. We start here with. Uh, beech trees and amelang here, sort of woodland. See over, it's very dense. So the plants we planted there in the beginning, they disappeared. So we left over with now with some carexes with uh, dry, uh, you can cross it and send dry shade and ferns. And so, so the number of species reduced dramatically, but there's still enough to, to work. But when the trees become mature, you don't need that sort of rich them anymore because you look, it's more about the atmosphere. Winter, so it's, it feels if you're uh, not, not, it feels like you're in a street or some, some, somewhere, but not a normal street, of course. Or in the fall, where you'll see that, you know, of course, that uh, exuberant uh, coring. But this is the part that we, we just saw. You see, this is how it was when we came there for the first time. 
It looks a little bit like Noma, huh? but uh, a similar sort of a little bit bigger. This is how it looks now. Of course, uh, all of these developers uh, jumped in. They probably had some rights also to build along the High Line because they, they gave away the right of, of the railroad. So it was an exchange, but now it's uh, so much built now that is un unbelievable. You see these areas with more wetland plants on the left hand side, a sort of terraces where people can sit. This is more uh, North American natives over a whole length and uh, North American moorland or, or uh, wetland plants. But this is how you move over the that area. You see a lot of asters, North American grasses, sumac. Typical sort of wild feeling you get there. And it's still controllable, I think, in the sense that you have to keep an eye on it and you don't mind if, if something appears there as long as it fits in your, uh, if it looks good for your eyes. Different areas with more garden-esque areas. Also ephemerals. This area is, is I think, there's a depth of 25 centimeters of soil and gravel. You see, still, of course, in bad times, they water it, you know, but we try to give as less, as, as less water as necessary, but you can imagine if you would make something in public and you let it go by, by an extreme weather circumstances, then you're lost for a whole year. Huh? So you have to make uh, decisions that, uh, to keep it uh, going. But you see a lot of plants the, in, in fall that overrule the, the other plants from uh, summer. Uh, North American trees, uh, North American tall grass, prairie plants like Fredonias, also snow okay, Molinias, uh, and then Amorpha frutescens on the right hand side. Beautiful plant, not so much used. Fall flowering, fall uh, os, uh, asters. And the grassland with mainly Panicum and other plants, Veronicastrum, Helenium, uh, Baptisia. <coughs> uh, but this, is, this changes over the years. So if you uh, were here three months be before this picture, then it looked, complete, it looked like the picture, the, uh, the prompt picture of the book. And then section two, section two is, <coughs> yeah, we use more trees that we could find in gardens, you know, with understore and let's say underplanting that we, uh, you can find with, uh, yeah, here it's uh, yogura, it's carex, it, it is phloxus, it's tiarella, and uh, little ferns, but uh, epimedium, so plants you recognize from your own shade garden or woodland garden. Some cercus canadensis. Then a flyover where uh, people, that was of course the architect, landscape architect's ID that we would shoot plant, wood plant trees. The people walking over this flyover could look into the grounds of the trees, which is uh, a concept that we see more, but uh, used mainly North American trees like sassafras, big leaf magnolias, and uh, a lot of uh, rhododendrons, natives. This is the ground cover planting with runner ferns or the stechum. See, so if you look down, so not only in the trees, you can see this is what you see. And of course, in spring, we try to fill it in with plants, with bulbs that give this sort of color splash. The moment that you see nothing else than green. I have it here Amurius with some uh, Allium nigrum, and also Amorpha, the Canescence is a gray one over there. And this is also an area which we call uh, yeah, a lot of uh, American, North American species huh, like Solidago and grasses. As you can see every every part of it is has a, a different feel. So walking there with, even without knowing your plants, you just feel you come in another area, you, you know, that the feeling is different. 
and uh, and you move, uh, it moves, so it's not that you stand still and it goes to this, this plant. Oh, the third plant. It's not about the only had the one plant. It's about the experience of of this uh, when you walk. Uh, section three. Yeah, that is the uh, we call it Hudson Overlook. They kept that wild for the moment, so you have an overlook over the uh, over the Hudson, and on the right hand side is how the how the highland was when we they found it and when they started. And uh, one of the very old pictures. And then it's a sort of appendix that goes to the right, which has just finished, uh, I think, three years ago with many trees, elevated artworks. As you see, that is under, but it has changed so much with all the buildings that surround that area. So it's more like a canyon now than like a sort of, in the, in the past you had only the old buildings, you had an overlook everywhere you could look worse, but either a parking place or there was the other side of the road, but hard to see anymore. See, but it's fantastic that it is there. Nice day. Over the whole line, they kept all these elements of uh, the spurs and everything that you could. Uh, Find back, and they're placed in the in, in the in the same direction they were uh, before they started it. And of course, I was introduced or asked to do a part of a botan new botanical garden in the southwest south of Delaware, Exboro, unknown place. I, that's also I have a friend in Delaware, and and uh, I got a question if I could do. I work on a botanical garden or planting for a botanical garden in Delaware. So I thought, okay, I can just, uh, and I'm there, I can stay with my friends. But it was six hours from, uh, or four <laughs> hours from where he lived. <laughs> it worked, it didn't work, but uh, uh, the garden worked. But this, you see, this is typical, a uh, different planting. This is more based on uh, on habitats, ecological. Also, we, we use plants like uh, Russian sage, which, which is not really, from the same ecological system, but maybe ecological system, but not from the uh, not the same uh, habitat. Uh, but you see, that was wider landscape, completely different, and the experience is much different. If you look back to the Lurie Garden or the other gardens like in Germany, I've made, you can see a big difference of uh, of how how work develops. Our work develops in time, in the context of time, in the context of time, everyone appreciates more wildness yeah, because they, there's not enough, they say, nowadays. Yeah, you notice that outside, yeah, the wilder the better. And uh, also the experiments with wild. But yeah, we, uh, but we make a sort of wildness where plants control themselves because they're not aggressive and they keep themselves in a sort of in place. That is, uh, uh, like in a good system uh, where, where plants work well together. This is also designed to work well together by choosing the right plants. I think 70, 80% is North American native, 20% non-native, but they benefit the whole atmosphere and uh, you, see, you see what it does in the winter. It's also one of my, I have to say, riding horses. Huh? House and Word galleries. I work uh, with some galleries, House and Word in England. And that was in the middle of, of uh, farmland. They bought a uh, derelict farmhouse. You would imagine if you come there for the first time that you see that really that also people like that you must have the courage to see uh, sort, of, sort of possibilities to create a gallery that becomes world famous. Huh? <coughs> That is, they renovated it, so it's also a matter of money to make it work. <laughs> but uh, this is how it looked. So they introduced a lot of art there, and I think they, they represent a lot of artists, well-known artists, famous artists, and non-famous artists, but it's a nice house to be part of. So I was asked to do all the planting, but 
the only planting there was to do on the on, the, on this property, they wanted to use the, the field for market. So I only did this entrance planting and uh, and a small courtyard planting. And that was sort of, yeah, in my opinion, I should have a different uh, atmosphere. So the plants are different than this area, which is about approximately the whole area, 6,000 square meters. The plant is maybe uh, 3,000, if you take off the path. <clears throat> so you see this also, again, here on the side, we have plants that are tall. Let's say between one meter and 250. And so to embrace this the middle garden, this part is a pond, and then we have a piece of wetland. A block planting on this side, and then this we call a matrix planting, so dominated by sporobolus, particular grass, sketching sort of uh, bulb plan. So we, after the plan, we make a bulb plan. You can see what we use. We use Camassia, Corydalis, uh, Electronium. No. A lot of species to make it interesting uh, when, when the garden is not uh, just come out. It's the layout in the middle of the meadows. So we use steel, steel edges <coughs> to make it work. And this is the pond. This is sort of so-called wetland, not really wetland, but it's a different type of planting where we put a lot of plants that remind you of sort of wetland. The middle piece, <coughs> even if we use block planting, we also spread plants, uh, <coughs> let's say randomly. So we say, okay, uh, the garden is done, the design is done, and then we say, okay, I want to use uh, this, for instance, this uh, echinacea. We take a 250, we just throw them in between, so to let it, to create that sort of spontaneity, which if you know, will always work. That, um, that's one of the uh, Serpentine uh, Gallery uh, artworks that they put in the back of the garden as a backdrop. This. See what grasses do, huh? It's always I think nice to see that you that flowers are not don't have to be dominant, they're present but not dominant. That's the other side. So when you work for a client, then they come. Oh, we have gallery in Menorca, but uh, you know what I said, I've never worked in uh, in Spain, so we have to learn again. And make some mistakes, misjudgments, and then COVID, and you can't travel, and you. But it has to be done. So you see, this is became a very beautiful uh, little gallery, and the garden we were still working on. I think uh, it's uh, you know, very well presented. This was last summer after one year, a little bit crowded, so we had to take out some. But uh, so that's what we did a few weeks ago. It's a beautiful place to go to. I think it is, uh, what, how shall I say that? It's a place where you really uh, just uh, go, if you're on holiday, you should visit it. Menorca seems to be a nicer island than Ma uh, Mallorca. But, yeah, nice land. This is how it was found. This is uh, how I was asked to do the planting. Uh, of course, the, the thing Grant did the uh, sort of infrastructure, the master plan of the whole area. I did the planting. I think after after that, I don't know whether you were left out or where you, you suddenly disappeared from uh, the platform. Huh? No, we were through that as they go away also. Yeah, we're not, yeah. That had nothing to do with the planting, I think. But nevertheless, it became, a, uh, after some struggle in the beginning, and here you see, 
how it looked like. So it's always good to see places where how they looked like before. <laughs> you don't understand that someone would take the place to, to start something, uh, a gallery or a restaurant or, or something that, uh, uh, that if you see it now, you would say, yeah, of course, I would buy it. You know? Where, uh, yeah. I think we're allowed to be more. Too much, you know, but this was, uh, you know, it's a straight path. Uh, on the right hand side, the soil is very undeep, and still we <coughs> could plant it, I think, uh, and it works. I was a little bit afraid whether it would work or not. But uh, this was planting time. And uh, this was the experimental part of uh, the kitchen part where they. In fact, we give, uh, gave a sort of a little uh, plan in the beginning to start, and they filled it in, in during the summer with the ideas they had themselves. I think. And uh, it was the first year with, uh, they planted the kale, and then the dahlias came from us. And so all together was, was quite surprising. And then they hang up the dahlia bulbs, and mm -hmm. everyone thought, okay, they will never come back, you know, but they grew back the next summer. It's good planting. And it still happens. But this is the garden, so everyone is happy. <laughs> Everybody. You can see that. And that was shortly yesterday, and there's, you know, of course, it's all in the beginning, so everything is cut back, and it uh, looks like uh, nothing. Yeah, but that, you know, this is what it will become in the summer. And I think if you work together, what I said, uh, it's always good to work with. On projects that are beautiful, you know, where we also uh, the place is beautiful or the whatever gallery house. And I like public because then you can share it with other people. I think private is something you do sometimes, but also regret sometimes you know, because it's you never can show it, it uh, especially today. Yeah, but in the past, it was easy to take pictures and say, Oh, we're going to use them, but today it's quite complicated to use. People's private. This, these are not taken by them. These are taken by the gardeners. I couldn't come there for a long time, but you see, it looks beautiful. And I think also for people that come there to taste and to dine, and I think that is a surprise. Huh? They're very happy with the garden. Another center. It's, uh, so far, it's a center for daycare of people that uh, it's a hospital for cancer treatment. Daycare for persons and people. So we did that at Approachers a few years ago. Nice, nice, colorful building. Small garden, by the way. You can see that. Just, you know, it was just an example of a uh, small, small garden. But, and then Detroit, I, I've never, never in Detroit, but I got a letter a few years ago from the Garden Club of Michigan if I was uh, wanted to do a garden in, in, uh, in Detroit. You know, Ireland, which is a park district, Belle Isle. And I was always interested in Detroit because of their, the, the past, you know, and the what went wrong, and bankruptcy, and all these things. So, and art, uh, it's a community of people that uh, start, can easily find a house, uh, maybe not so easy anymore, but at that time, so I thought, okay, I'm interested in the city, so why not say no? It's a sort of, uh, if you're invited, you at least know people right away, you know, you not go to a city and have to find out everything yourself, where's the, where's the gra graffiti, where's the, you know, where's the town hall, where's the, uh, so you have people that right away take you along, and I think it worked very well. So we had a very good time. This is uh, last year. You can see this is the area. It's in front of, uh, I, I could choose it. It's in front of a bell tower, Carillion, Car Car 
and it goes to a botanical garden and also to a, a very classic uh, uh, building. The aquarium, the aquarium. So a lot of fishes in aquariums. <laughs> you see, we made something. Uh, so the pets were based on this clay fields, you know, dry clay soils. And I think I, that I, I started uh, with that for the design, for the layout. You see, then we made some beds with three different uh, type planting types. And people could uh, walk over lawn and grass. This was made, I think, uh, finished. There's a lot of wetland. So we're restoring the wetland now at the moment. So by, by seeding and by planting, and I think that's just done. But that's more sort of ecological sort of approach uh, with people that know more about uh, this than I do. And uh, you see, but. The rain garden on the right hand side. You see how I start with my planting. Planting. Sometimes I make blocks because at the end you don't see it when the plants are planted, and on the edge you mix them a little bit. You don't see that it are blocks, but it's nice to. It's more an idea that comes up while you're designing. So you think you play with some lines and then you do this, and then because. Uh, it has not, no purpose, to be honest. That has no, and that's a matrix planting where you see that every open space is one species and then it's filled in with little groups. So it's a, you can see what I mean. You can see which bats. Understandable? Yeah. So I go through this as a, uh, This was last year, so after one season. And then I have Fitra, Fitra Compass in the Wild on I think it's the last project I'm going to show you. I think there's a project was asked to uh, by the chairman of, of, of Fitra, if I could do a garden at their, at their properties, there's a compass where uh, many, many famous architects have built uh, uh, a house, very early Gary's and Asana, so you see all this old buildings and I think, yeah, okay, so, but plants, there were no plants, only cherry trees. So the whole area was just filled in artwork, the French artist, and then I, I, you see the building. And uh, I choose that because it was in front of this Herzog Dumeron uh, sort of uh, big house. And again, you can see that we have ABC. ABC means three different planting concepts. You can see block planting, uh, that shows again that just mainly the bees are all lower, let's say medium height, so 120, 140. Then you have C, that's all robust, that's all one from one to 250, also on the back. And a big, huge hedge that covers that area. Sitting mouse, this is the matrix, you know, all this little variety of plants in the middle of one species, which is Sporobolus. This is, uh, you see, A, B, C. That's Lines. I think uh, I like to do an infrastructure or say a master plan where people walk through the plants instead of along the plants. So I, I try to make a movement through the plants that you that you really experience it. So straight lines focus you to the end. So always the lines are curved so that you have to bend, bend and come into a new perspective wherever you are. I think that is one of my attitudes to. Uh, Planting design, not maybe around how she can make it geometrical or straight or whatever, but I think for just planting on itself, it's nice to have people can walk through it and uh, just go from one side to the other side. Uh, so it feels if you're there three times longer than you normally would be. This is how we 
transfer the plants on the ground just after. You can see there's a sort of rhythm, there's a sort of, uh, yeah, sort of balance over the whole area, even though the middle areas are different from the side areas, still a sort of, these are the taller perennials on the, on the seaside. This is spring, a lot of color, so, uh, yeah. You know, color is always gone in three weeks time. Eh? So at least you, you have color, but it's a moment and then it's gone. But it can look very sort of, but this time of the year, I don't mind. That's a little bit later. Now you can see how it, Uh, this is how we do it. Yeah? <laughs> a lot of help. And I think the help we have is always from people that know plants, that can recognize plants when they're not, you know, when they're just bud out. Uh, they don't have to be in flowers. So that's most important. So I work with, with uh, Bettina Jarstetter, who's a landscape architect from Germany. I know very well. I work with people. Normally, on my bigger project are people that know about plants, are good plants, and have a good feeling for plants. and, and <clears throat> Know how to do it. See, this was last summer. <clears throat> That's around the building. It's a different, uh, again, another planting type with a lot of testeria. In our trees. <coughs> in winter. That's another project I'm not going to show. That's uh... <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I hope. Is this enough? Uh, I think that's uh... <laughs> I can bombard you with more gardens, but you know. Um. Pretty good, yeah. Yeah, I think. Uh, yeah, I hope it was enough. Yeah. You understand what I do. Yeah. But I think we, if, if you are all right with it, and people yeah. have any, uh, we can take a couple of questions from uh, from the room. Yeah. Yeah. Is there anyone who uh, would have any? Good question. Okay, good questions, not necessarily silly. <laughs> yeah. Yes. We, uh, we have one here in front. Mm -hmm. <coughs> yeah, I come from this good one. And I'm uh, interested, in, interested in knowing a little bit about, I mean, what I find difficult to do planting is always the mixture. How many plants of one species next to the other one? You talked about the your block plantings and your matrix plantings. Mm, yeah. Within a block planting, when you do those, would you scale them up and down uh, according to the actual size of the? No, plant? yeah, it has to do with, with, with you know if you have a. Depends on the, how big the garden is, the the, the, mm. the border is, of where you're planting. So, on a larger scale, we make them, we make them from uh, two meters till five, five, four, or something. You know, every group. So that's what we do. Depends on the scale. So, but I think five by four is, is small when you have a large area. So. Yeah. Yeah. And in the matrix, we just, uh, yeah, you can make a matrix which is 30% uh, plant species, also 50% plant species. It depends on your idea at the moment. Mm. Yeah, but uh, first, I start with, I make a matrix planting. I start with a canvas that's open. I first make a list of all the plants I want to use and then I plot them in. It's sort of uh, not random, but with thinking, and then I see what is left, and that's I fill in with just okay with one species. Mm -hmm. But sometimes it's less in, in, in that sort of overall dominating grass or perennial, 
sometimes it's more. It depends on the, yeah, the day you're working on it. <laughs> Inspiration. Is that an answer for that question? Yes, yeah. that's fine. Yeah, that's another one that's down here. Yeah. yeah. Um, I worked with the climate adaptation project, but using more recent data and information. And you mentioned you were working with wetlands. So I was questioning in the future where we have more rain or more mm -hmm. like sea level rise. And, mm -hmm. um, and, and I guess the, the use of more water based planting or water based vegetation would become more important in the future. No, we have also. Uh, we have also extreme dry summers, so uh, you, know, you can always just plant water plants in a place where it rains in the winter and, and it's dry in the summer. So we have to work at more generalists, we call plants that can have wetness and can have drought, so in the middle. But we work uh, on, on a garden scale, so you always have to help the plants when necessary, but if they try to avoid too much water, so we try to find plants that grow well with not too much thorough no, care. But I think the future is, uh, you cannot say, okay, the, the south is moving up to the north because the south is dry and sunny and the north is wet and cold. So even if it's warm in the winter, you cannot put your Mediterranean plants in here because they rot away in the winter. So I think nature will uh, take care for itself without our help. And I think uh, gardens, we have to see the possibilities of how we can make it easier to maintain how can we make it easier? We also need not, a, I say gardens is not about natives or non-natives. The garden is about uh, what will work well and also what will benefit the other. So it's about aesthetics first, because the garden uh, around your house, it's, it's uh, if you see an ideas here, I see it as an experiment that will work or not work, but at least you can do it because I think it's also, you have to push things in one direction or other direction have to make yeah to think right what will work and it doesn't change by year you know we have this extreme rainfall but also extreme droughts in the same place so you cannot use the same plants so we have to uh, react uh, and you cannot what i said plants from the mediterranean you cannot bring them to belgium because they won't grow there not so easy <laughs> Not in general, I mean. <laughs> Any other questions from uh, yeah, over here? Yeah, thank you for the lecture. Yeah. Um, I'm interested a bit in, uh, in uh, the aspect of uh, native exotics. Yeah, what's an exotic? Mean, what is an exotic? A lot of the plants from North America. And, yeah. Uh, like, generally, there's a, a mega trend, at least the, uh, you can, one would claim in Denmark there's a trend of natives. So yeah. have you made in your project this idea about only using natives and how do you think about the balancing and uh, using of exotics uh, maybe on a gradient from yeah. the rural to the urban in, in terms of context? What is an exotic? Is that everyone that is in our community not comes from Denmark is an yeah. exotic? Yeah, okay. <laughs> then if we talk about the plant world, I think in around in our farmland, of course, many species disappeared. And I wouldn't plant garden plants in that, you know, in that area. Uh, we make gardens where gardens is an enclosed area where you make something beauty, something to teach, something to show people. Also, in my case, it's also an expression of your own sort of, you know, mind uh, that you want to share the beauty you can make for other people to learn from or to at least experience. I think then it's more not about native or non-native, it's about aggressive or non-aggressive. So if we plants behave and look good and work beneficial to the other plant and attract wildlife, attract bees, butterflies, everything like the other plant, the native plant does, then with non-natives you can extend your seasons because most of the non-natives flower later. The plants from North America, they flower mostly summer, July, September, and so on. So that's why I think for gardens they are important for the, uh, for, yeah, for the whole garden experience as, as gardeners. But I'm not talking about ecology, landscape, in the sense of nature. First, we don't have nature anymore. You know that, it's all made. And we made it wrong because there's less species left. But I would say if you work in the, in the, in the bigger landscape, you should bring it back to more species. But that is also a difficult 
issue, you know, because there must you need money to do that. You need ecologists that guide it. So, uh, so I, of course, I'm in favor of all these things that make the world better. But uh, yeah, by showing gardens, I make probably a little bit of the world better, but cannot create a new world. But is that enough for you? Or is it? <laughs> Thank you. There's uh, one, maybe last question yeah. from the front row. <laughs> yeah. I suppose when you do a garden, you deliver a maintenance plan afterwards. No. no? I need a good gardener. <laughs> <laughs> so would you ask this gardener to, let's say, uh, in, in, uh, in addition to Anna's question, would you allow for any um, migrant species from the outside to to interfere or in a good way that could be with your plantings? Most gardens that I make change over time. So things come in, come out, of the, and I wiped out, you know, but very slowly. And the process is so slowly that you need to be a good gardener to have an eye for that. <laughs> but I don't mind if there's sort of whatever plant flows in, which is nice, as long as it works well with the other plants. Yeah. Uh, we have that. Uh, it happens, you know. but. For me, for me, it's more about the experience than the aesthetics, you know, in smaller areas that uh, people have come there as a landscape architect or a designer, or even if, if you come there because you don't have a garden at home, it's good to, to see things that you probably haven't seen before or have seen in a different uh, context. So in that sense, I think I'm very open for all that happens, but into the right direction, sort of. Uh, and not that you do something without thinking or do something without thinking about what, what will happen after, you know, we have I've made so many mistakes in uh, my life by the, putting the wrong plants in. <laughs> and many is, of course, every time you do something that you not really regret, but could have done better. You know, we have used plants that are aggressive and we have to put them out, pull them out again. We have used plants that are, did live longer than two years, so we had to replace them. But when you work in public space, you learn quickly what works. And I think our, our, our profession of plants people, and then also not knowing your plants, but also how to put them down or how to design, design the plants is a specialism nowadays. And it is a, a big demand. I think everyone that is, uh, in, in, is organized in learning planting design or really are in plants, they will never, I've never asked for a job my whole life. <laughs> That's a good thing to know. For the younger crowd of yeah. <laughs> <laughs> No, but I have a network from, uh, let's say, if I, I've done work in America, I still do that, but I wind that down because I, I think Europe is big enough for my age huh? and then there's a lot to do. But I have a network of people that are really sort of keen on plants. They, they design with plants, they're different than I do, but I can ask them to come. They could even come over to Europe if something is happening. Uh, I have people. Uh, in the Netherlands that worked on my projects in America by just going with my plants to the site and set them out. So it is a specialism and it's underrated uh, sometimes because, yeah, a plant is a plant and a plant is on itself already nice. Huh? But in a community, it can be just the wrong plant. Yeah. Then, then what's, what's your advice for us? To, uh, to yeah, I follow this. your heart, I think that's more than uh, <laughs> easy to say, but it's fact, you know, if you're interested in plants, you really have to dive into it, you have to work with plants, you either work on a botanical garden or to learn plants, and if you have a talent for design, then that's a, it's a benefit, mm. so you can, you know the plant, you know how to put them together and how it looks well together, and then you learn over time, but uh, I think uh, I, I'm busy for 40 years, so... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, still make, of course, we'll make mistakes all the time, but I think I make less mistakes than I did 40 years ago. <laughs> Very many less. <laughs> I, don't, I, I don't tell stories about it. Now my first gardens and what I did, you know, working in Sweden with plants that didn't survive the winter, you know, and, uh, and not because of the cold, but they were uh, growing superficial with the roots and that uh, killed them. And, uh, so you could say Japanese anemones would survive after one year, not the first year. Persicaria would die because they are root superficial and all these little things you learn. And uh, I used uh, very short-lived plants like Gaura, 
Yeah, no, I could. <laughs> Many stories to talk about, but you know, I only show my successes. <laughs> In a, in, a, in a culture, in, a, in, in, a, in, the, in the years today, where we yeah. talk a lot about not making for, uh, faults, oh, it's nice yeah. to hear that uh, everybody makes mistakes. And I doubt uh, often, mm. yeah, like we all do. Mm. Uh, <laughs> and I, I just uh, get anxious sometimes of, of the responsibility. Mm. Yeah. I think if that doesn't happen, then you probably just sort of uh, you never think deep enough. Mm. Yeah? Mm -hmm. You need to doubt about what you do. Is it good? Is it not good? Can I do it? You know, and then when it all starts, and you suddenly panic because you think, uh, "Ooh." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And also, in our, our profession is good. We work in different areas. Uh, font availability, so you can design whatever you like. But if the fonts are not available, you have a big, it's a big issue. Either have to wait till they are grown or let them grow. It can take another two years. In quantities. You have to be aware that your planting design is always ready at least one season before uh, carrying it out. It's not always possible. I think it is then you can bring your order to to the grower and say, this is it, can you con uh, confirm? And then, uh, but it happens often and still, if you, uh, if you do that, you have to come back, if they come back to you, oh, we have this, it's not, it's not growing. So we have always things to replace. So it's never, uh, no, sort of never ending. It's never perfect, but uh, at the end, uh, it works. You see the seed heads of asters, huh? Mm -hmm. Just that or only, you know, that you see that, that you see the beauty in things that you normally would not see. More questions, more? We, we have uh, plenty of time, so uh, <laughs> <laughs> if you're all right with it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Are you there when they, when they do the planting? It's we try to be there on the right moment. So I've just reset them out. So that takes two, three days, and then come over and I just adjust a little bit okay. uh, if necessary, or yeah. so see if I did right. But normally, it, uh, in my planting plants, I don't have to adjust much. Sometimes I had a blind spot that you have to change one group with another, but not too much. But I'd be there just to correct and uh, just. Uh, you go away when they don't need me anymore. <laughs> <laughs> no, but maintenance is about good gardeners and, and, and the right people. To find them is uh, not easy. Yeah. You, you have uh, your own garden, right? A quite big garden. Yeah, I'm not. But it, we it made it easier open, for ourselves. It yeah. used to be open for the public? Or no, no. Or you used to show? Yeah. Not used, but we have now so much to show that uh, we can send people uh, very, Not anymore. Yeah. No. <laughs> you don't have to leave the country anymore. No, <laughs> no you can do that. So, but yeah. now it's uh, because uh, when you open your garden, you have an agenda, you know. Then um, on Tuesday, a uh, group so and so will come. On Thursday, a bus will come. So it is more that you want more private time. <laughs> When you get older, you want a little bit more private time, or not? <laughs> <laughs> we we had a discussion yesterday yeah. about um, not just educating ourselves, but mm -hmm. also the responsibility for the rest of society in terms of uh, of um, broaden out the knowledge about different plants and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Maybe you could elaborate elaborate a little bit on that. Uh, from that discussion? Uh, you mean that, that we, uh, now your garden making is something uh, that you expose to other people? Yeah, that, exactly. And, and yeah. that you and also your, try your, to, your huh? fund, uh, and also your fund. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> now, yeah, maybe you want to know that, but uh, I'm not. I had a big price in the Netherlands, it was 150,000 euros uh, six years ago, and I had to spend 75,000 euros on, on a found foundation. And I, I, I was thinking, now, oh, okay, I said, now maybe it's good to make a sort of green in the neighborhood fund. And that was, I, I, I found it cliche because I think there are so many people already uh, uh, lifting tiles from their house and putting, you know, in neighborhoods, but I was not very much aware of that. And they could get a little sum of money to, to buy tools or plants to do it. And I think, uh, yeah, every year is still happening. So one, uh, uh, 
group of people wants a fence around a little uh, plot where a developer wants to build a house in five years time and the other people want to do something in the street and so so it helps so uh, that's that's one thing that I wanted to do you know I want to share things and I also want to uh, also show that I'm not only sort of for this sort of push gardens but I like uh, any initiative from uh, uh, in, in people living in uh, communities or neighborhoods or cities and I encourage that you know that uh, it doesn't have to look beautiful to be be uh, necessary <laughs> it could be a vegetable garden could be a plant garden could be a sort of small nursery that uh, provides a neighborhood with plants but that's what we did and uh, we run uh, you know almost run out of money but you know, <laughs> <laughs> who wants to uh, donate yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no. But that's good. But we try to do more than just uh, these, these kinds of things. Mm. What is what is your experience then when you bring in the community to take care of the garden? Uh, uh, because you said that you need a good gardener. But then what happens when you? No, we have they, involve they, the community. They right. We we uh, we ask them to create volunteer about people that can volunteer two hours a week or so, some days a week. So you organize that a particular morning or, or two particular mornings that the gardener goes with them and goes to the garden and they can learn gardening. It's good, it's not, yes, that's how we try to do it. It's not that we depend on only gardeners, but also how gardeners will uh, create a group of people or not. And that works in most gardens. We have a, in a, Delaware, that's botanical garden. We had a list of uh, 400 people who volunteered. 400. 400. And you also have volunteers. At, but then you can only have so many, so. <laughs> <laughs> and there's also a volunteering group at the Highland? Or? Also, yeah. Also, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 No, no, also, I think, not Vietra, but I think uh, also in uh, Detroit. Hmm? Battery, also, Highland. Most, most of the gardens have. Hmm. Great with that. So some interaction you can add yeah, to no, this field. Yeah, it's so easy, huh? Yeah. <laughs> you don't have to do it. And add can add to the biodiversity <laughs> somehow. Yeah. Now I can just say that this is how it works, how it can work better. Mm. And you can spend less money, but also teach people the sort of gardening. Yeah. Being outside. Yeah. Right. <laughs> you can call me. Uh, good, yeah. good, good, good. <laughs> we have placed her here to do this. <laughs> the classes on the front door, of course. No, one last question. Yeah. I want to go and see the High Line soon, but I cannot decide whether to go in summer or autumn. Do you have any advice? Yeah, I would go um, November. 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 Maybe November, late October for the full color. Yeah. Would the Estes be blooming in November? The esters will they be uh, in bloom? In yeah, bloom? I think it's when the when the when it get a color that the trees. There's a lot of American trees that color very beautiful, and I think that is a beautiful moment also for this yeah. uh, for the atmosphere. I think uh, it's not really about flowers anymore. But... Go ahead. Mm -hmm. yeah, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> See you. Uh, yeah, I just wonder if you have, in talking about biodiversity, do you have any data collection from maybe biologists or anyone who does like... I think that you could go to data. the University of Sheffield, James Hitchmo, Nigel Dunnett, they have big... Uh, uh, yeah, they, they prove that in gardens, there's more biodiversity than they prove, but at least that is what they wrote down, than in, in general in landscapes, because they became so poor in that. So uh, you could write to university, you can ask for, for you, know, you can find natural donuts. Uh, yeah. we, we were actually lucky enough to have Nigel here uh, oh, okay. a couple of years back no, doing a come back. lecture as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's uh, yeah. All right. Yeah, and one, one more thing that I work now with James Hismo on, on what, like Tom Schur Smith does, on this sort of, Perennial wetlands, or perennial meadows. So that's uh, planting in plugs and seeding. And then, of course, you have to let it go. 
with good management in the first years. So planting in a layer of sand of eight centimeters or 10 centimeters and just uh, seed among it, keep it wet till everything comes up. There's also a new uh, development on larger areas where you try to, uh, to it. one thing you cannot bring it back, you know, with maintenance, it has to develop itself, but it can be beautiful as well. So there's so many gradients nowadays to create a garden or so an area for yourself. Yeah. Uh -huh. This is uh, the time to ask. Don't sit on your hands. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, I'm there. Yeah. yeah. Um, do you know these uh, meadows that follow the Danish farmers? They cut out and it's facing the river because uh, yeah. they find these things ugly, but ecologically they have a very important fu function. So, how do we make like na nature that is ecologically beneficial? Beautiful as opposed to what we do. Yeah, ecological beautiful can also be beautiful. Yeah? <laughs> Something ugly can also be beneficial. Yeah? Yes. <laughs> but you know, how can you make people aware of that? Yeah. It's not my task. <laughs> <laughs> I can only show what I do, and I, I can agree what you say, but it's other people to, uh, to jump into that, you know. I think there should be a management, you know, in meadows, of course, that you can make them richer and so, but we're too rich already in sort of nutrition uh, over the years, so that, that, that's why they became poorer. Poor, huh? mm -hmm. So you have to, it's, it's a mind change. And of course the government, they, they talk a lot about doing things, but I don't know if they do really, uh, they put money in, do they? Yeah, they gave farmers money to do an edge on their land uh, to create some sunflowers and other things to affect. Uh, that's not really uh, ecological, don't you think? No? Is that true? Also here? They are getting better. <laughs> it's getting better? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, for, you know, everything, everything, <coughs> everything better is good. <laughs> we are undergoing a, you've got coming from a, being a very, very highly agricultural country. Yeah. There's a slow movement to to put in more natural parks. Yeah, now that's good. Yeah. Yeah, I think we don't. I don't know how we have that at the moment. Not so much. I think there's so many farmers that get the money but don't do it. You know, they're still mm -hmm. mowed at you know on yeah. the outside. And that's uh, <laughs> of course you have to pay a fine, but mm -hmm. they never control it. So. Which uh, thoughts do you have about soil? We are in Denmark experimenting with gravel or stone? Oh yeah, you know, for every soil or plant. <laughs> <laughs> but it's more about drainage and uh, I think nutrition. So I think, uh, in fact, if the soil drains well and I think uh, it doesn't need to have be so fertile. But I think there's enough variety. I think our soil brings variety in, uh, uh, variety in soil brings variety in plant. But I think drainage is, is uh, one of the key things for a good planting. And gravel is very good in that <laughs> <training. laughs> yeah. But do you have a method when you are preparing? No, we site? look at the soil, but I think I'm, I'm, I'm not. We take soil samples, of course, and we yeah. take care of the drainage. And I think we try to make things uh, run off uh, all days, you know. But, uh, it's more technical uh, thing that you know that if you don't drain well, then the plants get harmed. Mm. Not a good question, not a good answer. Or? <laughs> <laughs> In the older day, we always described soil sampling with our soil. Mm -hmm. But now we are. Uh, oh, you mean, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Now, yeah, we, we of course, you still need. Maybe we can use more gravel or more stone. Yeah, but you still need, you know, the gravel only 10 centimeters, not the thing will germinate, but will die uh, after uh, one day of sunshine, you know. Mm -hmm. so. We need some under the gravel, need to be something, a sort of package of soil where plants can grow in too, uh, under the gravel. But we need, there's a lot of gravel used nowadays, you know, as a top soil, mm. as a top. And also, yeah, it depends on where you are. If you're in a very wet area, the gravel will drain into your soil and it becomes messy. And so it's not always the right people take 
you hear about travel, you think you can put it anywhere to make it look good or at least, uh, but I think you can also put, uh, you can use another merge like Bark or Bark Tips, small Bark Tips, uh, anything of the so many. This beetroot uh, merge, I saw uh, there was merge of Bracken of that fern, you know, this woodland, that thick fern, they, they compost there. It's a very good compost or mulch. I think you should, you don't necessarily have to put gravel everywhere, you know, <coughs> maybe in drier gardens, but uh, no, yeah. Mediterranean gardens, dry gardens. Okay. Are you, are you changing the beds uh, in, in the years, 20 years ago? I see you, you part them in square when no. you sit the, when you make the pattern and no, but that changes a little bit because we said when we're on the side we say mix the edges a little bit you know so and how can you uh, are you able to go back to that pattern later if you dig everything out <laughs> if you dig everything out and plant it again yeah you can do yeah. it but you know it's but not a meaning the design is just a starting point of where you know that everything is in order and yeah. in sort of uh, uh, balance. And then, of course, you have to look at the garden. What happens, you know, then when plant grows a little bit, yeah. there's always a plant that grows a little bit faster than the other plant. Mm -hmm. yeah? Yeah. So you have yeah. to, yeah. you can cut it back. So you can stay, stick to the design, but it's not necessary, in my opinion. Okay, fine. Yeah? <laughs> I remember when we had Nigel, Nigel Dunnett here, he, um, he told, us, told us that he used to bring students uh, to, um, to map the, uh, the dynamics of, of his, uh, his design was um, horrible work, <laughs> it took a lot of time, but, but have you ever done that with any of your designs? With the Lurie Garden? Sorry? Yeah, yeah. I don't have, I don't work on the university, so I have not have students. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's, Maybe uh, volunteers? No? <laughs> Maybe volunteers then? No, no. too busy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's good to do it, but you know, it makes no sense because it changes all the time and it's good. It's good to have this documentation, and I did it for Lurie Garden, and then we have it now. Mm. It's not even in the head anymore. No. But again, about the maintenance book, huh, book plan, I use 1A4 because people always ask, What do I have to do when the plants flop? I can say, Okay, cut them back or bind them up. Something like that, you know, but it's very easy questions uh, that, uh, and, uh, and, and I've had for the high numbers a book this thick about maintenance. Nobody read it because <laughs> everyone that goes into the garden never takes a book with them. What shall I do today <laughs> with this plant? It, it makes no sense. But you have to do it somehow. Yeah. Yeah. It's been lovely to see you, all your successes, but I think uh, many uh, of us are hesitating because we know that if we, we, if we jump into a project like this, which is really the perennials and yeah. colorful and so on, very often it ends up with uh, the, the ugly dust and takes over, so uh, Urtica and Elytrigia and so on, they just come and push out the other. And yeah, in all your pictures, it's only... Uh, very beautiful grasses and very beautiful perennials. No, but you don't want to see every grass today. You want to <laughs> <laughs> but the question might be, uh, uh, what are your main approach to avoid that happening? Now to start with, so that is clean. So you, you swap the soil, you exchange the soil. No, normally I would bring up uh, a medium that is uh, maybe a cover that, uh, the, the existing seed banks. Not always happens because we have horse tail in our garden. We cannot get rid of it. We have uh, we have all these things you probably uh, will uh, not like. Sometimes you have to deal with it. Sometimes you would just, uh, when you start from new, from fresh, you can avoid that. And that's what you need. You need a good team of gardeners that keep an eye on it and, and, and find it when it starts. Yeah, it's, it's the world, yeah? <laughs> Uh, you know, this looks good, <laughs> but it's all all died. Eh? It's not alive, eh? so it's uh, still alive. So in that sense, you can say, okay, that that. And uh, if you talk thirty years ago, people wouldn't like this. They would say, okay, why do you want to cut your back your plants? Because they, they, the whole 
idea of gardening was sort of a household, huh? mm -hmm. cleaning up the paths, uh, raking in between your plants. So everything had to be neat and, uh, and nice. So in that sense, yeah, the world has changed and I think I'm glad it, uh, it will uh, have another view on gardening uh, today. But also gardening means freedom. Huh? You do what you like and, uh, and enjoy it. And, uh, I only show what I like. <laughs> <laughs> I could show more, but I'm a little bit stiff. You know? I, worked, I worked so hard last week, you know, by walking, uh, so I'm completely stiff here. So. <laughs> so maybe we should also, uh, if there is a, a last, 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 last question, there's a last question. No. So, so we make that the last question. No, no, it's time enough. Okay, well, at least you, we have a question. When you start on a project, do you, do you decide on a color scheme or is there any other factors that... No, color is an edit, uh, is added on, on top of the design. You know, we, yep. we never start with color, so start with a palette of plants that I can use in that particular place. So I say, I make a list of, say, I have a, let's say I have an area. <coughs> I think uh, it's big enough and I write down the names that I would love to use at that moment and it uh, could be 30 species. 50 and I see it as a palette so I pick one and I start to dot that down and then take the other one so it's like dotting from top to bottom sometimes you start with all the grasses so that they are on a different on the, on the right sort of uh, distance from each other and then you could start if to make it easy with the 30 flowering plants to dot them in a in the system and then with the late flowering and then in the middle where everything flowers, you can do that at, at last. Easy. <laughs> <laughs> Could you say so? I think uh, yeah. John has a question here. Yeah. I say thank you to you, Peter, because I've been inspired by you for, yes, at least 25 years. Yeah, thank you. That was the first time I visited your garden and your small nursery. Yeah. And uh, one thing there. When you have the nursery, you also view the plant with the material, how it grows, yeah. how it expands, or, or die. Or now, we learned a lot by, we, uh, we had to collect seeds. Yeah. In particular time, some seeds you have to collect yes. when it's not ripe. You know, like scutellaria, you have to just move the plant to see it. Other plants, uh, like geranium, that springs away. You have to know, you learn to know your plants by the roots, because you divide them. You know that an aster looks like this. Uh, and, and uh, whatever, uh, Veronica looks like that. And uh, so you learn a lot. On the other hand, a nursery is something, it's a system of watering and so that you don't know what it does in the field. So you can be surprised what the plant does when you plant it out. <laughs> but at least you learn to know your plants and learn to know when to sow it, when to divide it, when to prop how to propagate it. So you know, a fox you can only do from cuttings, you know, or from root cuttings or from top cuttings, side cuttings. Some plants you cannot do. That's right. And uh, one thing more, you have also written and have been in two or three books, at least. Ten books. Ten books. Yeah. <laughs> I don't have them all. <laughs> Some of them. And then make a, I did write to learn a lot. I cannot write. You combine it. And you have surprised me several times because, yes, I know a little bit of it, all of the perennials, but not all, and we're not finding all here in Denmark. If you ask for them, you can have them. They will take them down. Yeah. Well, the yeah. internet brings a lot of plants when you're a gardener. And you can find a lot on the internet. I think we, but that's what we noticed. Uh, the world is smaller concerning finding plants. And of course, uh, what I always noticed when we made our first book, Green Plants, the New Generation of Garden Plants, was in the 90s. And I was showing a, 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 those plants in a lecture. I said, well, why do you show these plants? We cannot get them. I say, but if I don't show them, we will never get them. Yes? <laughs> we will never ask for them. So you have to start somewhere in the middle of the starting a process of people find, try to find them. Yeah. And that is uh, just do that. <laughs> no. Now, now, now I think. <laughs> no silly questions. I really no silly questions. <laughs> Only good questions today. <laughs> I, 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 I.
think it's fine to start with that. I actually don't like to, but uh, but but maybe we have time for one one very last question. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but then I just want to say thank you enough for for coming here and presenting your work and your thoughts. I especially enjoyed uh, also all the questions and the dialogue. Um, and it was been a, it's been such a pleasure to have it. Mm -hmm. um, so so thank you. Uh, thank thank you, you for having me. Thank you.